The romantic red dust of the Sahara is not mine. The call to prayer is not mine. Not in the way the River Thames is mine. The sounds of a Devon summer holiday beach are mine. A pint down the pub is mine. I am as British as they come, like hot buttered toast and bacon sarnies, and still something of an alien in my own country. The words there of my guest today, the journalist, author and entrepreneur Kamal Ahmed. You're listening to Changemakers with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and I'm Michael Heyman, and welcome to Journeys of Discovery. Over the course of nine conversations, we explore fundamental questions about what it means to be human, and they accompany nine incredible concerts. Kamal, welcome, and words of reflection there from you from an outstanding memoir, The Life and Times of a Very British Man, and a very personal take on your own journey of discovery. Thanks so much, Michael, and what an interesting project this is. Yes, I was very fortunate to be able to write a book about some of my experiences growing up as a mixed black man in the 70s and 80s in uh, London. Um, and that really has been an awakening. But oddly, Michael, the awakening came a lot later. Mm. It's interesting, my generation, we accepted a huge amount of what was around us, whether that was the education system, the racism that people of color faced, in a way that when I look at my children who are in their 20, early 20s or in their late teens, they really demand respect in a very different way. And my awakening about that wasn't until I was really a lot older. Yeah. In a way, Michael, not until I sat down and thought about this opportunity to write about experience um, from different points of view, because my book, not only about my journey, uh, but also about our discussion as a country around diversity and inclusion, equity, what it is to be prejudice. Um, uh, it really was only by sitting down and thinking that you often get an awakening. And so much of our time, isn't it, is is, is dealing with the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, absolutely. dealing with your work, your practicalities of your house, your life, your family, your mm. loved ones. That actually awakening often only comes by staying still for a bit, thinking about something, and then trying to um, work out what that means for you. Well, and also, I, I suppose, when you're very conscious about things around you, and I suppose it's why these two ideas of journeys of discovery and awakenings really, I think, work so well. I mean, and also, in your opening paragraph there that you read, I mean, that 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 is a paragraph that is is steeped in the idea of awakenings. Um you wrote you wrote that on on the back of um, a visit to the Sudan, um, and I, I just wonder in terms of evoking what you know, it's almost poetry when you when you read it in terms of the sort of you know the red dust of the Sahara um, right the way through to hot buttered toast and bacon sarnies. I mean, it really feels like an ode to awakening. Tell me how you felt when you, when you read, what, what sort of where did the power come in that writing? I suppose I've always been quite fortunate. I mean, it's fascinating that we're doing this with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Music has been a very important part of my life, of all types. Um, my grandfather and my mother, both skilled um, musicians. Um, what, what were they? What, what did they play? So my grandfather, who's sadly dead now, obviously. <laughs> um, he. So my grandfather was choir master and organist and um, pianist. My mother is also a pianist, but a singer. And they were, it was always very much part of my childhood, uh, particularly classical music. But also, you know, as a teenager growing up in London, of course, pop music, etc. cetera. Um, and I think the rhythms of music, um, I, I try and reflect in my writing. I've been very fortunate in my career as a journalist to be able to you know, write a lot about you know, incredibly moving and serious moments in, in the history of of this country in, in Britain, but also mm. around the world. And I think when you're thinking about writing and communicating and you're trying to connect with people's emotions, um, that connection between the rhythm of music as a storytelling um, method and the rhythm of writing um, as a text-based method of communication are, are very closely aligned. And it's interesting, you know, so it's so funny to hear myself now described as an entrepreneur, but... Um, I do now run my own business. You're leaning with, into it, I think. Well, no, but it's, it's, in, it's interesting because one thing, Michael, we're thinking about at, at, at my new um, business is 
how do we use music yeah. alongside the text of the work? Yeah, I mean, let's not let's not lose the rhythm of of, of writing. I'm I'm reading A. M. Wilson's Confessions at the moment, and he says something quite similar to this, which is that sometimes when you're gifted with the rhythm of language, you've got to actually make sure it it, it gets it has meaning as well. You know, sort of. So, but I think that, I mean the ultimate sort of you know, sort of win, it's when you have both, that ability to sort of convey bit meaning, but also that beauty of the prose and that beauty of the, um, that, that beauty of the sort of, um, I guess, the rhythm of those, those prose. I mean, but you and I have known each other for a long time, but I had no idea how important music was to you, to the, to the degree we, we've just been sat watching a wonderful dress rehearsal uh, for the RPA, and I learned there and then that you were a member of a youth orchestra, I mean, we, we, I mean, there could be a, a Kamal Ahmed in, a, in another universe, in a parallel universe that was a, up on stage today, could there not? Possibly. I don't <laughs> think so. I wasn't quite good enough, to be absolutely honest with you, Michael. Um, but no, I was, as I say, I had classical music was a very big part of my um, childhood, given my family um, sort of expertise and connections to it. And so, yes, I played uh, the bassoon for Ealing Youth Orchestra, Ealing Youth Orchestra, um, to this day, is a is a is a well known youth orchestra rated, in, um, yes. in in London, West London, where I grew up, and I went to Ely Music School as well. And uh, we're all blessed, aren't we, Michael, with with people who help you on a journey. Um, the conductor of of um, Ely Youth Orchestra was um, a guy called a man called Stephen Block. He was also the head of music at my school in West London, where I went. And I was blessed to have him. You know, someone who was very encouraging of young people getting into classical music. Um, and not seeing it, I suppose, you know, music of the type that the Royal Philharmonic, you know, plays can sometimes be seen. And I know the RPO works incredibly hard that this isn't the case, but for a sort of an elite audience yeah. or a different type of audience. And I was very lucky that I went to comprehensive school in West London, very mixed school. But under Stephen's um, guidance, he made classical music very much part of the school's life. And it's an important part of that idea of creativity around um, music and then writing for me um, really was that journey and that awakening was during my teenage years yeah. and then into my into my 20s. But yet today is the first time you've been to see a classical concert of orchestral music for quite for quite some time and I, I, I took out of it that you were affected by what you were witnessing in terms of this incredible you know sort of group of human beings coming together to create that incredible sound. Um, and also a sense that you might have missed something. Well, you forget. I, I, I remember playing at the uh, Royal Albert Hall with Ealing Youth Orchestra. And also we went on tours onto uh, the continent of Europe as well. And the team that's needed to make great music of any mm. type, what well, doesn't matter what type of music it is, is the same as elite sport. Yeah. And you forget that um, it needs all the parts to come together. And I just was, I was taken back. I suppose we're talking about a journey, but obviously journeys can go the other direction. Yeah. I was almost taken back to those teenage years of Ealing Youth Orchestra rehearsals and then the great moment, the, the adrenaline, the, the joy of performance with a team of people all there to create um, something which touches your audience. I, I think you're right, Michael. I'd, I'd slightly forgotten that feeling. Yeah. I, I haven't been to a, a classical concert of this type for many years, and certainly I'll be uh, I'll be making sure that is not uh, my future. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing that, that I, I took out of that that, that sort of um, really rehearsal. I mean, yes, it, it's it's sort of almost feels like an insult to the word rehearsal because it was so beautifully done. Um, but just as you say, what, what a performance endeavor it, it really is. Hearing you know Vasily Petrenko, the, the conductor, talking about the backstory to some of the music, um, telling some of the musicians very strict instructions about what they needed to do and what they needed to sort of put more effort into, and you really got a sense of this is you know we, we see the obviously the, the sort of the end result, the kind of the, I suppose the retail experience of this highly polished orchestra, but you really saw a human endeavour at play, didn't you? I've always thought to myself the great great impact in creative spaces is down to two really important things, emotion and discipline. Mm -hmm. And if you can get the mix of those things right, I remember when I was head of news at the Observer newspaper, my editor there, Roger Alton, 
he would have the grand, wonderful ideas about what should be in that paper and how we should be covering the big affairs of the time. But also, he would be a person looking at every picture byline to make sure every word under a photograph explained what the photograph was about. Mm. So it was that. I, I learned from him this idea of the emotion of the writing, of course, was absolutely vital and the beauty of the photography, uh, but also the, the detail, the discipline needed. And you got that, as you say, Michael, from that rehearsal, yeah. that, that, that when... Um, the conductor was speaking to the organist. First time I've seen the organist, the, Royal, the organ at the Royal Festival Hall, sort of wonderful experience, that alone. But then him trying different stops on the organ yeah. to get a slightly different sound um, for one of the pieces. That is what makes the difference for the audience when they feel that relaxation, yeah. that and someone has produced something of, of great art that, that, that connects with your emotion. And of course, you know, you sit, you sit there listening and you have no no real idea of just how much fine tuning how much effort goes into the creation of that let's get let's get back to awakenings because i mean your career seems to me like a series of chapters of of awakenings um whether it's you know you mentioned the observer there um through to your years at the telegraph onto the bbc and now onto the news movement where it feels like they're they're all chapters of um, of change um, and presumably personal awakenings in terms of what you wanted to do and, and who you were. H how might you sort of summarise that incredible career? I think there's always been a thread. I think from my very first day when I walked into Leeds student newspaper at Leeds University where I was studying politics because a friend of that mine... That didn't come up in the biography. <laughs> <laughs> no, a friend of mine, um, John Rigby, a very well-known producer now at the BBC, for BBC News, um, he just said, we were studying politics together. He said, why don't you come down? This is quite an interesting thing. I've just got involved in this student newspaper idea. And it was the first time I really had a notion that, that the power of writing could be used for all sorts of different um, uh, out, outcomes. And one of them was journalism. Uh, and, and I think there's been a thread through uh, my career around being driven by a value, I suppose, of information is power, empowering communities, audiences, societies is a vital part of the good society, democracy. Um, and wherever I've been, as you say, I've been, I've been very, very fortunate in my career, whether that's at Scotland on Sunday, whether that's at The Guardian, The Observer, The Telegraph, uh, the BBC, um, to be able to think about journalism and how it can support and help um, people be informed. And so, although you're right, and, and there have been chapters, but just, yeah. although you're right, there have been chapters, I think there has been a, a thread, which I, I think drives probably most journalists, which is we're here to inform, hold power, to, hold power to account, and explain the world so that people feel empowered to go on their journeys. But I suppose you've you've done that, that, that job from a number of different vantage points, you know, from... from political vantage points in terms of the, the stance of the Guardian and the Observer, presumably to, to working for the Telegraph, you know, from the establishment journey of the BBC to now being a highly disruptive force in, in, in the news um, business. I mean, it, it's not been a sort of linear, straightforward um, series of chapters, has it? I mean, I presumably, and presumably there are different types of Kamal in, in that journey, are there? Yeah, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe, speak to the people who work with me, I don't know. But I think it's always been about um, thinking about the audience first and what do audiences need. And certainly when we relaunched The Observer, um, that was all about uh, thinking about a reformulation of the Sunday newspaper. What was a Sunday newspaper for? And we really thought deeply about that before we relaunched the paper to you know, a high degree of success. I was actually brought into the Telegraph. You're right, the political um, uh, uh, angles of the Telegraph are somewhat different from the Observer, but actually it was on a modernisation journey. William Lewis, who was then editor-in-chief um, of the Telegraph group and is now my co-founder of the news movement, he wanted to modernise what the Telegraph was, particularly mm. in digital uh, spaces. So that was a modernisation journey about uh, supporting or, or giving audiences um, journalism via the channels they were using. And at the BBC, when I was put on, uh, when I was made editorial director, 
uh, on the BBC board under under Tony Hall. Tony was uh, who was then Director General. And Tony was very clear to me, and it was very much part of my job there, was to think about ways of reinventing storytelling in news because the data is showing, um, whether that's in the UK or in the United States where the news movement is operating, but in both countries, one of the fastest growing categories in news consumption is news avoidance. Mm. That younger people in particular, but actually many, many audiences, are disengaging from some of the ways we have delivered news over many decades, and there need to be new options. So everything has been probably, Michael, although different in politics, different types of institutions, it has been a journey of modernization. I mean, we'll come on to the news movement in a moment, but it strikes me that each of those chapters you've worked with, with change makers, people that wanted to modernize. Where did you feel most at home? Well, it's a great question, Michael. I think I, I've, been, I've been very fortunate that I've worked with brilliant people. I, I, I suppose I would reformulate that slightly, but where, where was I? The Observer was an amazing uh, period of my career. Um, under Roger and with John Mulholland and Nicola Gill and Paul Webster and many, many others, we, we had a, a purpose and a mission mm -hmm. that Sunday uh, newspaper uh, journalism um, needed a new type of player alongside the brilliant players that are still there, whether that's the Mail on Sunday, whether it's Sunday Times, Sunday Telegraph, Mirror Group, whatever it might be, the Sun on Sunday, etc. cetera. Um, and that was an amazing journey. Um, feeling most comfortable, that's quite an interesting question in many, many ways and a really brilliant question. I mean, as a person of color in the media industry, that hasn't always been the easiest thing. I, I think I'm most comfortable now <laughs> because A, I'm frankly older, so I've yeah. got more levers to navigate. And also one of the points of the news movement is what we call, you know, hyper-focus on diversity and that it's only by having a diverse team uh, which is not only visibly diverse, but is diverse in thought and approach, um, that you can really serve. We actually like to talk about communities rather than audiences. Audiences are quite a passive thing. You go, you're an audience in a theater. Yeah. You're taught at from the stage. Communities have a conversation. And so I think it's probably, I hope now, Michael, because I've been in this career 35 years. I mean, goodness me, you know. Um, so I suppose I am hopefully most comfortable in my skin with this team of people, which William and I have built from scratch. So that's been a fortunate thing for us. So the to disruptor do. is is a is a part of the Kamal. I built my own. I bit, Will and I have built our own team. Right. And I think being You've not having had to the inherit privilege, it. having yeah. the privilege, Michael, to set culture from the get go. You are an entrepreneur, Michael. You have built an amazing organization. You know, we were fortunate enough to first meet, you know, 15 years ago. Mm. And when entrepreneurialism wasn't the narrative it was now, you spotted it. I remember you coming to me at The Telegraph, where I was head of business and economics, uh, and really saying, this is something that you should yeah. be focusing I on. And, and I, I think I've always been open to that idea. But when you build your own team, and culture is so essential to delivering on your mission, on your strategy, being able to build that and set it very distinctly with, with my co-founder, Will, but also we have a group of us, five of us, who are all the co-founders in London and in New York. That's a great privilege. Yeah. I mean, I can remember some of our early chats when you were at The Telegraph about, you know, having this discussion about how important it was to have a publication that was for business. And I remember this was something that, you know, we spent quite a lot of time talking about because, of course, the role of the entrepreneur wasn't well understood and I could seriously take our interview down that enterprise route but I'm going to have to I'm going to have to sort of uh, sort of restrain myself because if somebody was to ask me now um, to describe your persona then and now I would say this is a person that is very comfortable in themselves somebody who has found themselves awakened to their surroundings in and I, I've seen you in the various chapters from journalist to broadcaster now to um, disrupting entrepreneur, um, it feels that something has clicked. Now, as you've said, there, there, there is probably something in, in the mood music that changes um, in terms of the world around you, but there also seems to be something very personal to you in terms of the person that you are today and the person I met 15 years ago. 
that's very generous of you, Michael. And um, yeah, it's very it's genuinely touching that you say that. I think that I've been very fortunate. I've been very fortunate in my career to be um, working for and with uh, incredibly talented people. I think you're right. I went and gave a talk at Cardiff Journalism School um, on Friday with one of my um, with one of my team, Cloda Griffin, who is 25. She's on her journey in journalism. And speaking to the young journalists who are coming into journalism there, I, I, I did make the point that if you're driven by values, and I've been very clear on what my values are throughout my career, um, you can hopefully have a, 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 um, a really advantageous uh, journey in journalism um, to be super clear about what it is you're trying to achieve. But look, Michael, you know, as you've seen from a rehearsal that we've just been uh, privileged enough to watch just now, you make mistakes. You, make mistakes. you, you yeah. Michael, yeah. have yeah. seen maybe the, the, the outcomes of my work at The Telegraph, my work at The Observer, at the BBC. But... Hey, I make mistakes just like everyone else, Michael, and 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 uh, there have been lots of hiccups along the way. But I suppose <laughs> revealing yourself that is is an important part of actually moving on, awakening. I mean, we all go through the book. It. We, yeah. the, the book writing was. Yeah, I think it's that notion of accepting yourself. Mm. I think that um, my generation um, of journalists, you know, we first came into into this uh, sector in the nineties, early nineties. Um, uh, it so much has changed. The style of leadership has changed, or has to change, but changing maybe rather than changed, has to change. Um, I grew up, Michael, in a, in, a, in a system which was, you know, like the armed forces. There yeah. was a general who was the leader, and you were told what to do, and you, goodness me, you did it, or yeah. you got almost genuinely a kick up the ass, if I can say that. I you, that you're that very, word is okay. very entitled <laughs> to say that. <laughs> so now you can't lead like that. You have to lead as... Um, we talk about community externally. We also talk about community internally. Mm. We are a community of journalists who want to create the best we can, whether you, you are one of our new student journalists or me, the editor-in-chief. We all want to work together. So it is, it is a very different uh, route and ways of working now than when, when I first started. But my sense is that, that the book has been quite cathartic for you. Um, that yeah, I think actually, that's true. I, I, I wonder... I mean, having having co-authored a book, I, I I kind of felt I learned quite a lot about myself during the process. It, it almost, almost that the pages were experiments, actually, in terms of just getting ideas down on paper. Actually, quite a lot of it was I didn't know what I thought until I wrote it. Actually, in some in some ways, um, how, how how did that how did it work for you? Yes, I learned a huge amount about myself. I learned a huge amount about why are people prejudiced? My whole my whole book is a is a, what, an, an attempt they? is an attempt at a disquisition mm. on on the notions of, of of prejudice and why it exists, and it is in all of us. Whatever our characteristics, we will have things that we are prejudiced about, and that's because the brain has to have functions about how to sort the world around it. Um, uh, we don't we can never know seven over seven billion people individually, mm. so we sort we sort groups and we have hierarchies. And that leads to prejudice. And it's by understanding that we all carry prejudices inside us of whatever description that actually you can start on the journey of trying to mitigate or solve for those prejudices. And I think that was quite a cathartic moment, I suppose, for me. And also learning some pride. As you said, I went to Sudan um, with my uh, two children. I met many of my family there for the first time. I had met some of them, but many of my family there for the first time. And that notion of accepting who I was, I think my generation or some of my generation, particularly those of us who were of uh, mixed ethnicity, um, struggled to place themselves mm. in Britain. We were very British, but we also black British. And that was a, a journey that the book helped me solve, where my pride for both sides of the fence, my mother's fantastic Yorkshire roots, you know, white English, and my father's black African roots are part of me. And I did discover through an awakening, I suppose, Michael, you're right, that that was an important, vital part of my story. Yeah, and yet you still wrote and still something of an alien in my own country. Is that, is that a view you still feel? Anyone of colour, I think anyone who has any of the what I called rather 
bureaucratically the protected characteristics, so whether that's disability or sexual orientation, uh, gender, uh, ethnicity, whatever area you talk about, if you carry one of those characteristics, you always know there's going to be some hurdles ahead of you. And I think even since the book, so the book is, what, four, four, five years? It was published, I think, 2018. Even since the book, I frankly have felt more comfortable now as an entrepreneur running my own company with, with my co-founders. That's more comfortable than being a big traditional bureaucracy, you know? So even since the book, I feel less of an alien. But I think all of us who carry whatever it might be for whatever reason inside us, there are going to be some hurdles there. And Britain sometimes doesn't know what it's got, if I'm very honest yeah. with you, Michael. And I sometimes feel that many of us, and I don't just mean um, those of you know mixed ethnic identity or who are black British or South Asian British or whatever they might be, um, have not always felt appreciated. Mm. The news movement. This feels like it's been years in the making um, in terms of, I don't mean that you've necessarily been sort of thinking about it day by day, but it feels like a very logical point for the person I'm talking to um, to reach, that you were going to do something different, that you were going to seek to try and help change things. Tell us about it. So the thinking behind the news movement is the idea that many audiences don't engage with traditional news um, content. And that's not to say that traditional news content doesn't have a vital role in, um, in uh, the type of society we are, whether that's in the United Kingdom, in the United States, all around the world, in other parts of Europe. It does. I worked at the BBC for eight incredibly enjoyable years. We did things at the BBC when I was there that were some of the most vital uh, pieces of journalism anyone could ever do. But we do know, and the data tells us in no uncertain terms, that audiences, many audiences, it makes them feel um, alienated mm. from the agenda of politics or economics or business or even sport or culture or entertainment. And because the ways of distribution, distributing information have changed so much, they have other places they can now play. When I was young, Michael, if I was the same age as my kids, you know, you could, all, you could, miss, you could literally miss the news. That is not possible anymore. No, uh, news is always on, and also the distribution channels are always available. And so it was time for new offers, for a new, new players in this sector. And that is not to say that we are unique. We are doing something unique in terms of our demographic, of the styles uh, and the systems we use. But if you look at other players in, um, in that space of trying to reinvent what the news might mean, like Vice or Brute or Ride the Wave in the, U in the US or Now This, this is a whole category, Michael. This is a category change, which is a new form of news content, which we hope, and so far a year in, we have you know, some good data showing us that we're on the right tracks from very, uh, you know, very early on in our journey. We hope that a new way of formulating news from short to long form in digital spaces, video, text, and audio, can address this group of people who are leaving the news or avoiding the news. Mm. Because if you don't have journalism, fact-based, balanced, non-partisan, with context, that everyone can agree on the facts and also the onward journey, what do I do with this information? Journalism will suffer, will wither, and therefore democracy and the good society is then challenged. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like the news movement is like a the ultimate journey of discovery, actually, in terms of what, what, you're, what you're doing with it. And actually, I mean, you and I spoke about it about a year ago when you were just getting started. And of course, we, we've witnessed an incredible year since we spoke, you know, sort of war in Europe, economic disruption, pandemics. I mean, do, do these things give you an extra sense of urgency in the mission? Because the news is becoming so big, so dramatic, so important in our lives? Um, 
I've never been one, Michael, to say somehow this is the most incredible time ever. I lived through the fall of the Berlin Wall, right. um, 9-11, the death of the princess, uh, princess of uh, Wales, um, the financial crisis. You know, there are huge events. Right. The, 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 the problem was... Is probably well, my no, no. <laughs> the, pro the problem was that um, young people need to engage in ways that they understand on the platforms they love, particularly younger people, but actually lots of different audiences, and that was why there is an urgency of now, not because of the news agenda, but because every year fewer people are engaging in traditional news media. So every year the drip, drip uh, danger of journalism not being part of everyday conversations for many, many millions of people, that was the urgency of now. Events, dear boy, constantly happen and are constantly, constantly big and important. Mm. And the last question, um, I'm just thinking about um, Kamal, the teenager, playing the bassoon for the Ealing <laughs> Youth Orchestra. Give yourself some advice then about what you've learned about awakenings since. It's to try and remember to relax <laughs> at times. I think in life things are so frenetic, you don't give yourself time to think. Now, when you're young that's maybe great and you can keep all that going. But give yourself those pause moments. I think you were so right about the book. The book was a big pause moment in my life. And I think I now have, I'm so blessed to have two young children starting on their journey. And it's just about trying to support them, retain confidence in what you're trying to do, and sometimes just rest and think. My big thing is every now and again, you need to go and look at the sea, see the waves crashing on the beach, have a think about where your life is, how you are supporting the world around you, your family and your loved ones. And that actually is, I hope, pretty good advice. What a wonderful place to leave it. Kamal Ahmed, thank you so much for joining me on Journeys of Discovery. Thanks so much, Michael. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Our audio partners are Rode and our soundtrack today, Strauss has also Sprack Zarathustra, was provided by the BBC. You can find out more and book tickets to see the RPO's Journeys of Discovery series live at rpo.co.uk forward slash journeys.